Hey everybody, how's it going? Great. Hope you're having a great day at F8 so far. Lots of exciting announcements at the keynote. My name is Chaitan. I'm a product manager at Facebook, working in the AI org, supporting our speech efforts. I'm here to talk to you today about some of the work we're doing in speech and audio as we build products to help our user base have better experiences and protect them from bad experiences. Before we kind of go into our talk, I kind of want to just remind everyone what Facebook's mission is. Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build community. We don't want to just have Facebook be the one connecting you. We want all of you to have the power to connect each other as you interact and engage with more and more communities. When we think about what it takes to really give people the power to build community, there's a few areas that we've been looking at recently where we've noticed some interesting trends. Both speech and audio are very relevant in these trends. The first trend is on voice. For the last several years, we've seen a remarkable trend of people engaging with smart speakers, assistants, various different products, software, and hardware using just their voice, whether it's to get information about what's going on in their day, to find out what's happening in the news, to communicate, call friends and family. Voice is a very natural interface that people are finding is very useful and easy to use. And the other trend that we've been noticing is audio. If you've kept up with any form of news, you'll see that audio and video content is constantly growing in production. Whether it's video content, where people are producing and consuming more and more, it's podcasts, it's music, it's sound, audio is super relevant. When we think about how do we help our user base have a great experience, and how do we help them have the power to build community around speech and audio, the first thing we think about is, how do we use voice to help people connect with one another and have an easy, lightweight, natural experience? Using voice should be not only natural, just like having a conversation with a person, it should feel expressive, and it should help you connect to the people in your life that matter. And when we think about audio, understanding what audio content is out there on the platform, it's really important, not just because we need to be able to help people engage with that content, but because we want to be able to understand what content is relevant to what audience, and also protect people from content that's bad, like hate speech. Over the last few years, we've been working on a few different use cases that use both audio and speech. Video captioning was one of the first use cases we thought about when we thought about how can we help people engage with video content more. And so we thought about how we can help people have a better experience, whether they have accessibility needs, or they just want to consume video content without sound. Focusing on a captioning can help you engage with the content and the author of that content more easily. From there, we started to get our feet wet with hardware as we built our first VR product, Oculus Go. Oculus Go was interesting because it's very much the perfect form factor for showing why voice is a very powerful medium for engaging with a software experience. You don't have a natural keyboard input. You don't have natural ability to use your hands. And so using voice to navigate, search, experience what's available was great. And it taught us a lot. A lot of learnings that we applied towards our first major hardware product that we released last year in the fall, Portal. A voice first experience dedicated to helping you connect with friends and family through video chat. And over time, as we've learned more and more about what really makes voice experiences powerful, what makes them feel emotionally evocative as you connect with your friends and family, there's a lot of takeaways that we're going to need to apply to all future products that we build, whether it's future products from Portal, whether it's future products from Oculus around AR and VR. Irregardless of which direction we go with our hardware and our products, we know that speech and audio are really important. And in the long run, we need to keep investing in speech and audio to be successful. Let's go to some explicit benefits of how video transcription and understanding the content of audio will help us give people a better experience. The first example, as I mentioned before, is accessibility. People that can't engage with content right now, they can't understand what's being spoken. There may be language barriers. There may be people that just can't hear what's being spoken at all. This doesn't just allow them to engage with the content. It allows them to connect with the rest of the world to be able to engage with people that they otherwise would not have been able to engage with at all. And not only accessibility, there's people that in general just want to watch video content without having to turn on audio. 
It makes for a much more pleasant experience if you have captions and can understand what's going on in the video, even while you're watching silently without headphones. Some of the other benefits of content understanding, as I alluded to before, are relevance. Not only can we now understand what is the content about from the audio, we have a better understanding than if we just looked at the post comments or the text. This understanding helps us build better relevance in our ranking models and make sure that the content is delivered to the right people, the people that really will engage with it and enjoy it, as well as in making sure that people that won't engage with it don't have to see it and have a bad experience. It's also important to remember that not everyone in the world has good intentions. And so there are a lot of bad actors out there that may propagate things like hate speech. It's important for us to be able to understand if that content is going to be harmful to people and have a bad experience. And through understanding what the content's about through transcription, we can ensure that people have a better experience by avoiding these pieces of negative inflammatory content. And so it sounds great. There's a lot of benefits to understanding content. What's the catch? Well, we're Facebook. To really succeed in our goal of building a great content understanding platform, we can't get by with just English. We have over 2 billion users that are represented across the entire world, every major demographic, every nationality. To really be successful, it's critical that we're able to ensure that we support all languages. And all these languages out there, there's a lot of them. And it's really important that we have a great parity of experience across the different languages. Scaling to support this is not necessarily easy. There's a lot of different challenges involved in building machine learning models that can adapt to every different language out there, all the different vocabulary, speech patterns, local slang. Before we go into some of those challenges, I want to give a very brief overview of how speech recognition works at a high level. Put differently, the goal of a speech recognition task is to take some audio and map it to some text that is a prediction of what was spoken. You take some high-level features, you put it through a few different models trained on data, and then you output a prediction of what was spoken. Let's go through an explicit example and familiarize ourselves with the high-level components of ASR. On here, you'll see an acoustic model's job is to take audio and output phonemes, or sound units, that represent sort of the phonology of language, all the different units of sound that make up words. And you might say, well, how do you make sense of all these different units of sound? Well, luckily, you have a dictionary that basically represents your vocabulary. It's a mapping from words to how you pronounce them into these sound units. This dictionary is what we use to make sense of all the different phonemes and go from your acoustic model to sensible words. But now you have a bunch of words that need to be put into a sentence. There's a lot of different combinations you could use. How do you figure out what's the right combination? This is where you'll use a language model, which will help us actually understand the context of the sentence on the words and figure out what's the most likely combination and sequence of those words that makes sense. And there you go. You have your output of your ASR task. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Now, if you want to make this scale to every different language, you're going to have to do the same task for all three of those components and build those for every language you want to support. And that gets a little complex, as we'll go into in this next section. So what exactly is the big challenge in scaling to all these different languages? There's obviously a component of collecting data, which we need to train our acoustic models and our language models. But that's not too bad. As long as you have someone that understands what the content is in a given audio, video, content, as long as they can write down the spoken form of that, you can get training data. But when you go to something like a pronunciation dictionary, where you need to have a deep linguistic phonological knowledge of a language, this is the kind of thing people go to school to study for years for a given language, this is where it gets challenging. You might say, OK, well, like, why can't you just find all the experts? Well, imagine there's only 5 million people that speak a given language in the world. And out of that 5 million, you have to find the few experts that exist that actually are familiar with all the nuances of that language. You can see how this gets challenging as you scale to more and more languages. And given we're Facebook, it's important to scale to all the languages that matter to our user base. Keep in mind, also, this isn't a one-time task. 
language isn't static. Language evolves over time. New words come into existence. Old words fade out. Meaning changes. Pronunciations change. Vernacular and slang pop in. So this is kind of an ongoing thing you have to deal with. So how do we scale handcrafting these pronunciation dictionaries? It's pretty difficult. Well, let's take a step back and just reevaluate what are we doing end to end in the ASR process? Is there a better way? You have some audio. You put it through an acoustic model and get a bunch of phonemes. You take those phonemes, get words from a dictionary. And then from the words, you get a sentence. End to end, if you think about it, the big issue we have is this big dependence on phonetic systems. The fact we need these pronunciations and we have this dependence on these pronunciation dictionaries, that's our big bottleneck. Is there a better way that doesn't involve depending on pronunciation? What if you could just learn how audio maps to text? Well, the good thing is there is an approach. If we migrate away towards graphemic systems, the idea of rather than using the sound unit, using the text unit, you can actually solve our problem by getting rid of the sound unit completely and going straight from audio to letters and words. Think of it like an AI typewriter that's listening to what you're saying and typing out letters and then making sense of those letters into words and then words into sentences. And now the nice part about this is as we get more and more training data, we can even just learn new vocabulary and slang from the underlying content. We don't need any special expert. It just happens automatically. And so that's great because from our goal of staying up to date with what is current in a specific language to make sure we have a good understanding of how to transcribe and understand that content, this meets our needs. And so this challenge we had of scaling data collection for training these models and building these dictionaries fades away from being a big challenge around dictionaries, just being an operational challenge around data. And while not to say that data is easier for us to scale and capture, it is still challenging. However, it's much easier for us to scale data collection for a bunch of different languages, transcribing that audio, rather than having to find experts in every language from a phonological and, and linguistic level. And if you want to get your hands wet and try this out, you can as well. Go to GitHub. We've open sourced our wave to letter package, which allows anybody to train their own speech recognition system using the same technology we just described. There's papers out there published you can read as well. Highly recommend you check it out. And a small tidbit. Today, Facebook is processing hundreds of years of video content daily. Now, I don't know how to describe that to you because I personally can't fathom what 100 years of audio content even sounds like or feels like or how much it fills up in a room. But the key thing I want to point out is that is only going to keep growing as Instagram and Facebook keep producing more and more video content as you support more and more languages. And so our challenge isn't done. It's going to keep growing, and we have to stay humble as we keep pursuing the next step in this challenge. Let's move on to a bit of our voice interface experiences. How many of you here are familiar with Portal? OK, I see a raise of hands. Portal was our first hardware product that was geared at helping people connect with their friends and family easily. The goal of this was to be something that would be different from other products by focusing on your connection to your family. Think about how many times you call your family in a given month or week. And think about how much friction there is in the video chat process. To achieve this goal of making it super frictionless, super easy, we knew we had to use voice. Because voice is super natural and easy. But the bar is really high. When I think of the bar, I think of it as it has to be easier than me shouting into my living room, hey, mom, how are you doing? That's how silly, stupid, easy it has to be. And that's not an easy bar to meet, especially because as we worked on Portal, we realized how you build a voice interface experience and how you make sure it's successful is very different from a video transcription experience, where you're OK with having most of the content transcribed and having a good experience. In this case, it's not about getting most of the content. There are very tangible binary outcomes of success or lack of success. And as you'll see here as we walk through a concrete example, there's many points of failure, which mean we have to be very precise about how we optimize our speech recognition and our voice interface to make it successful. At the start of an experience, you might say, hey, portal, call John, where hey, portal is basically the word that activates the device. 
as you go through from wake word, you're going to actually try and verify, did you actually intend to activate the device before you try and interpret what the command was? What did you actually say? Who are you talking about? As you go from there, you take the transcription, and you try and understand what exactly was the intent and who was it targeted towards, whether it's something as simple as a calling intent aimed at John. From there, you're going to actually execute the action of calling John. And hopefully, John's going to pick up. But either way, it's not a great experience if we don't give you a feedback loop. And so not only do we have to execute the action, we have to give you a response. Not just a text response, but an audio response. Because it can't be voice interface without having voice input and voice output. And so there's at least three points of failure here, potentially four to five, depending on what can go wrong. And any one of those points of failure can mean this is the difference between you called John successfully, or you called the wrong John, or you didn't call John, you messaged John, or you actually didn't even activate the device. So our job just became a lot harder. If I were to concretely break this down into four problems, I'd say it sort of goes from understanding if the device actually woke up, trying to understand what you said in the context of a very noisy home environment, figuring out what name you're actually saying when you're trying to call someone, which on its own I could go on for hours about. And then, of course, figuring out, given a name, which person is that really mapping to? Because many people have shared names, especially in your social circle. And so figuring out who you're trying to call is super important as well. Let's start off with voice activation. You'll notice there's a lot of sources of noise in your household. It might be your TV. It might be some pets. It might be people speaking. It might be door slamming, cars outside. When you're trying to make the device activate, there's two scenarios we want to avoid as a bad experience. One of them is you're trying to activate the device, and it doesn't activate because it didn't think you said the right words or it didn't understand you. And then the other bad experience that we want to avoid is you're trying to not activate the device, potentially watching TV, and it activates. Both of these are really important to get right. The former, if it doesn't work, means people won't think the device is reliable. And the latter will violate trust and privacy. When we thought about this, we thought we could go with two approaches. We could try and treat it like a speech recognition problem where we understand what you're saying, hey portal. Or we could try and just be very precise, treat it like a matching problem. We're not trying to figure out what you said. We're just trying to figure out if you said this exact phrase. When we went with that matching approach, we found that this helped us improve our accuracy a lot more and was really useful for helping us avoid this sort of false wake situation. But when you're talking about speech recognition in the context of having all these different noises, that becomes a little more complex. Because now you have to actually understand what's being spoken, and you have to make sure that you recognize it accurately, despite accents, background noise, and pronunciation issues, especially with names. And so normally, you might take a bunch of data. You might record it from a home. And from that, you might actually take that data and train on it. When you think about homes and the sources of noise that are available, there's a lot of different room configurations, furniture configurations, people in your home, different accents, different sources of noise. Can we really do a justifiably good job operationally getting all that data from the real world? Well, we thought, why don't we try a different approach? Why don't we just try simulating these scenarios and use a software simulator to build a bunch of data? The nice thing about this approach with a software simulator is not only were we able to simulate thousands to millions of different configurations super easily, we can easily update that by adding artificial noise, new conditions, new environments that we hadn't considered, and make it easy to maintain and grow and improve over time. And through this, make our systems robust to noise. Another challenge, as I mentioned before, is how do you figure out who you're trying to call? A name is a name, but a person is who that name maps to. It's who they matter, who they are in your life, their relation to you. Luckily, we're Facebook. So even if there might be three Josies in your life, your gym partner, your sister, your colleague, we should be able to figure out who you're trying to call, given the fact that we know who matters in your life, who you engage with, who you call in general on Messenger, who you message. And through that, we can figure out, hey, you call your sister every weekend. That's probably who you're trying to call right now. This is the difference between calling the wrong person and having an awkward conversation, and calling the right person and feeling like it's a great experience. And now, the biggest challenge of all, names. How many people here have issues pronouncing a name the first time they hear it? Feel free to raise your hands. 
How many people have issues understanding a name the first time they hear it? So you can see, this isn't a problem that's just hard for machines. It's hard for people as well. And I know personally, I had a lot of issues when I was going through this and trying to understand, hey, why did the system fail on this utterance or that utterance? I said it like this, wait, oh, this is really hard even for a normal person to understand. Because names aren't like regular words. They eschew a lot of common conventions. And one of the biggest challenges with names is the fact that they're very easily affected by regional characteristics. The same name written one way could be spoken two different ways depending on what country of origin it comes from. So our speech recognition models had to incorporate figuring out not only the name, but the context or region it came from to make sure we're applying the right pronunciation to it. Let's go through a few examples real quick of what exactly some of those actually are. So Jean, very common US name, just like Jean's, very simple. However, if you look at John in France, like Jean-Pierre, Jean-Paul, different pronunciation, spelled the same exact way. Both of these are valid pronunciations. Let's go look at another example. You have George, very common American name. But in Spanish, this can be a variety of different pronunciations. It could be Jorge, it could be Yorgi. You could have a variety of different ways you pronounce this, all valid. That on its own is pretty hard to recognize because now we have to adapt to the fact it's not just George when you say the, that name, it could be a variety of different ways you pronounce it. James, US name, very common. You might say, hey, how is that like something that is easy to mess up? There's got to be no other pronunciation for that, right? Well, if you follow football, then you might be familiar with James Rodriguez from Colombia. And you might say, James, that's a very different pronunciation than James. I probably wouldn't have recognized that at the first attempt. And then let's go to an example where both pronunciations are not valid. You have this name here properly pronounced Chin Ha, that might be butchered if I were to try and pronounce it with American pronunciation systems as Qing He, something that I'm sure no proper Chinese system would recognize as the same underlying characters. As you can see, there's a lot of different ways that this problem can be exacerbated. On top of that, you have accents, which will make it even harder and harder for people to understand what is being spoken. But the good thing is, our systems are designed to evolve, just like people. I remember the first time I used to go to class, every time I went to a new school or went to a new grade, I'd always talk to the teacher and people, and they would try and say my name. And at first, they might say something like, cheating. And I'd be like, not quite, but you're getting there. Try again. And then on the next attempt, they might be like, chetin. And I'm like, you're getting closer. You're not quite there, but you're almost there. And then finally, they would say chetin. I'd be like, eureka, you got it. Just like real people, we want our systems to evolve. We want them to adapt. And we want to make sure that over time, they get better. Because it wouldn't be comfortable to you talking to a device that doesn't get better over time and is static and constant. And so these are some of the challenges we had to deal with as we built a voice interface for Portal. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Lior, now, who will walk you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Hi, so I'm uh, Leo from uh, Facebook AI Research in uh, Tel Aviv. Facebook AI Research is the part of Facebook with the goal of advancing AI and building AI systems for the benefit of all of humanity, not just people in Facebook. And in order to do this, we act in a very open way. So everything that we do, everything that I'm going to present today is actually published. And most of it is also open source, so you can go ahead and try it for yourself. We can basically do uh, whatever we want as long as we advance AI. We are encouraged to collaborate with other teams in Facebook and with outside uh, teams as well, as long as we uh, stay at uh, the cutting edge of uh, research. And whatever we do, we try to scale it up. So it's AI at a scale and not some uh, niche approach to AI. Today I'm going to speak about text-to-speech schemes. Text-to-speech is TTS. And this is a method for creating multiple voices. So we would like to create TTS in many different voices. 
And if you think about it, we are, there's an ongoing revolution, just like Chetan said about interfaces, and they are based on the fact that there is high quality text-to-speech. And text-to-speech might be the best example of a generative deep learning model that is being used today. So there are many different models for deep learning, for recognition, for classification, but generative models in the real world, the best example is text-to-speech. The question is, how do we scale it to many different voices? If you want to get a very high quality text-to-speech robot today, you need to get an actor into a studio for tens or hundreds of hours and record them with very specific texts. How, do, how can you scale it such that each and every one of us can have their own personal assistant with a different, a unique voice? Because pretty soon we are going to be in a situation where everybody comes with their own assistant and they want to have a recognizable voice to their assistant. So the system that I'm going to talk about, TTS Skins, it's a WAV-to-WAV system. This basically means that the input is an audio and the output is also an audio. So the input is an audio, some sentence being spoken, and the output is the same sentence in a different voice. And if you want to apply this in the context of text-to-speech, then you have the text and you have the TTS robot which outputs some sentence in a generic voice, and then you convert the voice using the skins system into another voice. So it's essentially a voice conversion system that enables you to use the TTS engine for many different voices. Let me just be technical for one slide. The input is an audio, and then we encode this audio using this convolutional neural network, using a neural network. Now this neural network is exactly the wav to letter network that Chaitan spoke about. This is a network that recognizes voice. Why is it a good idea to use this network? Because a network that recognizes what is being said needs to be agnostic to the speaker and encodes the content, which is exactly what we want. We want to get speech features that are invariant to the speaker that, that uh, we record. And then we can actually add the speaker. So every speaker in our system, every speaker identity is encoded as a vector. If you want to switch speakers, we just change the vector. And then we free this free, these speech uh, features and the speaker ID to a decoder. A decoder is a machine, a neural network, that gets these inputs and outputs audio. So let's think a little bit about applications. I'm going to describe both demos that you can try out right now and some scenarios that the, the AI experiences team thought about. So let's start with a scenario in which we want people to share in a fun and delightful way. Hey, let's start the movie in five. I can't wait to assimilate you and your popcorn. I can't wait to assimilate you and your popcorn. I can't wait to assimilate you and your popcorn. I can't wait to assimilate you and your popcorn. Nobody gets my popcorn, you fucking bots. So, just behind us, over there, there are the AI-powered uh, demos. And you can play with this demo, for example. You can convert your voice into a whisper. Or to a unicorn, which is another voice effect. Hey, Sasha, can you give me a latte before the movie starts? Sasha, can you give me a latte before the movie starts? Hey, Sasha, can you give me a latte before the movie starts? 
So you can play with this. And if you think about future applications where we integrate such technologies into Facebook apps that you're already using, this is one possible scenario. Hey guys, uh, doing a review of uh, Devotion uh, Espresso. Just got my cup, super excited. Uh, let you know how it is. A little raspberry, a little chocolate. Pretty sweet on the notes. Uh, let's head over to the next one, check it out. I just got out of a new coffee place around the block. Here I have is their signature latte. Let me try how it is. Oh my god, this is so good! So developing these kind of applications is a lot of fun, so let's like a pick. Let's take a peek at the development process. Hey guys, check out this app Kevin and I built. Whoa, cool. But I think I see a bug in it. Uh, I'll work on it. Check out this new demo that we have. Is that the same demo that Sasha built? Yeah, uh, it's called Voice Effects. Do you guys like it? So, you can meet Sasha in, uh, uh, with the demos. But let's now make a, a shift. So we talked about one audio application, about voices. Let's move and talk about music. So our goal was to develop an automatic way to create cover versions. We call it music translation system. So you can imagine that you can hear somebody playing a piano, and you want to automatically convert it into a trumpet, for example. So you may think I should transcribe the music and then play it with a synthesizer or some other uh, MIDI instrument. The problem is if you try to go with this approach is that it's very hard because transcription is hard for humans, especially where there are multiple instruments. It's still hard for AI systems and there would be a lot of errors this way. So instead, again, we want to go from audio to audio. Build something, you feed it audio, and then it outputs a video in another style. And we want something else. We want it to be a universal translation machine, which basically means that I don't need to play anything in order to, it, to be converted. I can clap my hands, I can whistle, and then it would convert it to, let's say, a symphony by Mozart. So I can whistle, this would be the input, the output would be a symphony by Mozart. So this is actually a property that we call domain generalization. During training, we have a set of domains that we train on. Those five icons represent these domains. And then during test, after the system is built, I can take a new instrument and use it. And during training, I learn how to convert to each and every one of these domains. And even if I have an unseen, an unseen um, instrument, I can still convert it to these domains. So I talked about translating between musical domains. We saw these instruments, but actually the domains are much more complex. So an orchestra with many different instruments playing Mozart is an example of one domain. And, um, People singing Beethoven would be another domain. So the domains can be very complex, can involve singing, multiple instruments, and so on. So how can you tackle such a problem? Maybe you want to use a machine translation system. For example, a machine translation that translates between French and English. In Facebook AI research, we have the best such uh, systems. Maybe we can use a method like this, because if you think about it, a sentence is a sequence of words. An audio is also a sequence. So maybe we can use this approach. If we try to use this approach, then the input audio would be encoded sequentially until the end, and then it would serve as context to be later on decoded in a different domain. The problem is that we cannot use this approach because it requires matching samples. You would need, in natural language, you would need the same sentence in English and in French, which is not a problem to obtain. You can obtain very large data sets like this for most common languages. 
but in music, you don't have Mozart doing the same, the same uh, piece of music that Beethoven does. So you, don't, you cannot use a supervised approach where you have paired samples. Instead, our work relies on what is called unsupervised learning. We don't have any matching. We cannot guide the system. The method needs to learn by itself how to perform this translation. The underlying networks that we are using, they are called a WaveNet autoencoder. There is the encoder part that takes the audio and outputs vectors in some latent space. This is the encoding. And then these vectors are being used to, together with the WaveNet encoder to generate the output audio. What is different in our system is that we have multiple domains. And in order to create a translation, we actually have a single encoder and multiple decoders. So regardless of the input domain, we have only one encoder, and then we have multiple decoders that are being used in order to play the music back. The problem is that if you do it this way, the easiest way for the encoder to work is just to memorize the input. Just record the input, maybe compress it a little bit, but use different regions in the latent space for different domains. So it would put guitars in one place and a piano in another place, and then we can never perform this translation because everything is separate. In order to overcome this, we use two different techniques. Ah, before that, sorry. This is the type of memorization that is actually our enemy. We want the system to be able to, be, to uh, learn the underlying principles. We want it to be smarter and realize what are the underlying principles so it can recreate the music regardless of the input domain. There are two ways that we use in order to enforce this. The first one is called adversarial training. In adversarial training, we have a network. It's called the domain confusion network. The task of this network is to separate, sorry for this, is to separate between the domains. Let's do it. So the domain confusion networks try to separate between the different domains and tells which is the input domain that the encoder received. The task of the encoder is to confuse this network. The encoder wants this network to fail. So these two networks are adversarials. The domain confusion network wants to pull the domains apart. The encoder wants to make it such that no network can distinguish between the various domains. The second way in which we make the network smarter is by distorting the input. During training, the network does not see the original input, the clean input. Instead, we feed it with a version of the input that is distorted. We apply some noise, and then what the network sees during training is a version that is off-tune. Specifically, we take the input audio, we cut it into random segments, and then some of the segments, we take the, the pitch a little bit up. Some of the segments, we take the pitch a little bit down. But then, when we uh, train the network, we tell the network, you have to return the original music, not the distorted one. The only way in which the system can reproduce the original music is, that, is if it's under, it understands the underlying principles of the music. So once the system is trained, we can take an instrument and we can decode it to the same instrument, or we can decode it to each of the other domains. And as we said before, we can do, we can do even more. We can take an unseen instrument and we can play it in each and every one of these domains. So let's see the demo that we've prepared in action.
you can go to the demo and play a simple tune, or you can whistle or clap, whatever you want. And we can then recreate it as a Mozart symphony. Or as a choir singing Bach. Or as somebody playing a piano. So let me summarize here. Chaitan started by speaking about speech recognition, and there are many advances in Facebook in speech recognition. And then we shifted to talk about text-to-speech. And there is a lot of work in Facebook about text-to-speech. I only spoke about one corner of it. And then we shifted about tools that can enable users to recreate very impressive music, even if they, are, they don't have the skills. And what's really nice is that the AI experiences team created two demos for this event, two demos for F8. They're out there in the back. You can go and play with it right now. And Chetan and I will also go there if you want to uh, chat or discuss these uh, topics. Thank you very much.